Te mi vedi? Sì, ora ti sì. vedo. Oh, sì. perfetto. perfetto. Ok. Ci tanto siamo. Come, tanto perché... come stai? Sta, eh, bene, diciamo, ho appena finito un altro meeting e sono eh, qua no, da te. Eh, ma te ormai sei l'uomo... <ride> No, eh, ti ricordi che ormai è due anni che ho iniziato io, quindi sta andando benissimo. Sono arrivati tutti quanti. Good morning everyone, good morning everyone. Um, all right. So, allora, thank io you. non mi ricordo come facevo a... Faccio share screen, vero? Bravissimo, bravissimo. Okay. Faccio share screen. All right. Ah, dovrebbe essere questo. Okay. Microsoft PowerPoint share, sì. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm sorry for the little bit delay. We are live now. Today I'm very proud to have once again uh, one of my friends, uh, Jacopo Dallan. Good morning, Jacopo. Good morning to you. Good afternoon for Italian people or European people. Uh, so, uh, tu non vedi però il mio schermo, vero? No, not now. Not now. Not now. So, I've requested Jacopo to talk today about sinus, uh, spinoid sinus and cavernous sinus. For those who don't know, um, Jacopo contributed to an amazing book. And he contributed in a, in a book regarding internal carotid artery. And for those who don't know, Jacopo has been a, a hugely um, in, in, in anatomical uh, dissections and studies. So, Let me, let me see if you can share. Is this, you can do it, right? Uh, it seems to be easy, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not. So and try so to press the share screen and choose the, your one, the PowerPoint presentation. I have my PowerPoint presentation now. I see you, but uh, I think that you are not looking at the presentation. No. Oh. No, once again. Okay, share screen. Uh, okay. Safari, Safari, I'm going to this one. Optimize. Okay. There. For, so, Jacopo is... Uh, I'm sorry for my, for my no, failure. I've, I've been delighted from works from Jacopo, anatomical specimen and instructionals. And as a teacher, he, he's a brilliant teacher. He's a brilliant, uh, 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 I think also a surgical anatomist. Is it correct to say? Uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it was the, the main idea of the lesson was try to to change a little bit the paradigma uh, and avoid to show you simply anatomical uh, slides and videos and trying to, to put uh, anatomy into reality. It is, a, a, I think it's really the, the right way to make people fall in love with anatomy. Uh, I'm so sorry because I'm, I'm, I didn't find the, the way to, to show you the... Let me, let me see. Do you... Um, can you press share screen, right? Yeah, I've done, I've done, but uh, I, he asked me to, 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 he didn't ask me, he doesn't ask me to, to find uh, the presentation. I have the presentation on my screen okay. uh, and uh, he asked me share screen and it's okay. Okay, it seems to work now. All right, great. So I, did, I, I don't know exactly what happened, <laughs> but it's not important. <laughs> So are All you right. looking at the presentation? Yeah. Yes. So I think I can start. You see yes. my presentation running? Perfect. Can you okay. open the whole window? Yeah. And I put in the way. So you should yes. see the presentation running. Um, so let's go. Um, the, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, 
the philosophy of this uh, this lesson because uh, uh, Puja asked me to to talk about anatomy of the sphenoid sinus in particular regards to a possible corridors uh, uh, related to sphenoid sinus and uh, with a special interest to the cavernous sinus. Uh, as many, many of you have uh, spent my time in dissecting cadavers and uh, this was an occasion to, to learn how to deal with the spaces, uh, how to deal to three-dimensionality uh, of the anatomical structures. Uh, so first of all, I would like to invite you not to consider anatomy as an endoscopic anatomy. Anatomy is still anatomy, is the same anatomy, no matter the way you're looking at. So the endoscope is a tool uh, and the endoscopic and nasal anatomy is a perspective. So having said that, uh, my, my goal was to, to try to offer you a little bit uh, different paradigm about um, this topic because uh, uh, you, you can find a lot of books uh, with a very amazing uh, uh, anatomical dissection and structures. Uh, but what I've learned in the anatomical lab of uh, Manfred Schabischer that I would like to consider my anatomical maestro in Vienna and after that uh, also in Barcelona, uh, Professor Galino Prats. Uh, uh, what I've learned there is that uh, uh, you should create in your mind a tridimensional vision of the anatomy. So of course the, the knowledge of the anatomy uh, is important, but it could be boring. It could be annoying. Uh, every one of us has spent most of his time uh, or time during uh, medical school and studying anatomy in a very, I would say boring, no one should be offended by this, but sometimes it's boring to repeat and try to imagine. So uh, what I've learned in the lab is that if you are able to put the interest and understanding the real meaning of what you're doing and searching for, it's by far more easy to keep in mind the details. So uh, in this journey through these skull bays, it's a little part of this skull bays. Uh, I want to focus on transnasal endoscopic anatomy, basically on the sphenoid sinus. I know that Paolo Battaglia had talked uh, for sure uh, in a very amazing way about uh, paranasal sinus anatomy, but it's, it's something that Every one of us can, can do uh, in a very good way. But in this journey, uh, the queen structure is the uh, ICA. And uh, so my first way to, to talk about was, okay, these are structure, the relationship are in this way. And this is, was the, the lesson number one. And they said, okay, this is the risk and because I've, perfectly have in mind a lot of amazing anatomical lecture, mostly done by anatomists, amazing anatomists, but they are difficult to be followers. So uh, the concept was uh, why not changing the way to present and to make things much more appealing for every one of us. So if you want, if, if uh, some one of you has children and kids, the best way to try to make kids do things is try to make things interesting. So why study in anatomy? Just to know the names of the structures in a very didactic, boring way or understanding uh, the reason why uh, you should do and you should learn an atom. So it, what, uh, it's impressing to me uh, thinking about uh, Apollo 13 emission in the, the, whenever you think to be there, it is amazing to talk, to understand how what it, it was calm and why study in anatomy? Because you have to avoid and try to reduce the possibility to say uh, we have had a problem. And, uh, and to do this, of course, you should uh, understand exactly where you are 
And uh, by, by means of a concept of uh, the windows, uh, you can understand much more easy. But as I told you, if it, uh, I show you, it's a right side. Uh, you see on the left side, in this part, it's a right side. So you see the maxillary sign, you see the pointer, Puja? You see the pointer? Yes. Right? Everything is fine, everything is fine. So, it's, so you can see exactly, uh, it's a very nice picture. Uh, with uh, the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus showing the clear relationship with the sphenoid sinus, the basal sphenoid just over there, and pituitary and carotid, that clinoid portion of the carotid is a very few and a very beautiful and brilliant uh, picture taken in Vienna showing uh, the wall scenario. This is the way I don't want to show you an app. Uh, because I, I do feel that, uh, of course, I need to offer you the tridimensionality. But if I spend time giving you uh, a lot of details, I'm quite sure that probably I miss my time and I miss your attention. So some things should be, of course, outlined. Some things, some things should be presented. So it's necessary that uh, in this phenoid sinus, you should search for the uh, landmarks that you know, the optic nerve, the lateral optical carotid recess, the medial optical carotid recess, please do not confound yourself. It's not the same as the middle cranoid process. The pituitary prominence about the pituitary gland and the maxillary prominence and the video nerve, but you should be aware that these things can be seen from above. So these are really just the alphabet, really the basic things. And, and again, and again, you should see the uh, position of the optic nerve in relationship of the ICA, especially when you're dealing with some, I would say, uh, a little bit different condition, the Onodi Grunwald cell, like you can see exactly here, in which the optic nerve is totally uh, involved and totally uh, included in the cell. And it's but, and it's very important to go much more into the three dimension. So from there to there, it's the same. It's a very nice dry school showing the clear relationship between sphenoid sinus, left side, the Vidian canal, the foramen rotundum area, the maxillary tract, the optic stack just over there. And here you have the optic canal completely included in a, on all this cell. So how you can imagine and find this in your radiology. So this is the alphabet. This is the way in which, by which and in which you can go into detail. After the bony structure, and I show you the bony structure here, it's a bony structure. The bony is above the clinoid portion here. The pyroclival is just over there. The vidian nerve is just over there. The, the uh, pituitary region here is what is uh, Matteo is a very friend, good friend of mine as called a supracellar notch here that corresponds to the tuberculum cell here and the planum sphenoidale here, just over there. You should understand that removing the bone, you find what is just a little bit behind. That means the dura layer. And the dura layer, are, I would say, just like uh, uh, one dress over the other. And this is our anatomy. And the, by this alphabet, because this is really the basis. And if you want to learn to write and to read, you should start from the alphabet. So the optic nerve is becoming more evident once the bone is removed. The anterior clinoid area here is just over there. The white asterisk is describing you the position of the optic tract. And in very pneumatized sinus, you should find a small hole that is called lateral optical carotid recess. And on the medial side of this clear relationship here with the right circle, you see what is called medial optical carotid recess. Uh, we will go on in detail uh, after uh, that. And uh, um, 
I see, oh, this is nice, perfect. Uh, what a very, very good anatomy is there. You see, there is a very nice uh, yellow arrows, a very nice color in cadaver. Uh, yeah, but it's in reality, everything is related to pneumatization. So if you have uh, a lot of bone, no landmark can be seen and your anatomy should be recreated. Your soft tissue anatomy and in this era you are searching for the carotid artery you are searching for the optic nerve you are searching for the uh, pituitary region in this case you have learned a lot you know your alphabet but all the letters are put in a very difficult way and you are not able to read because you are used to think that okay this is the sphenoid have a look here uh, the uh, portion, the clinoid portion of the ICA, and you cannot see there. You have to find the clinoid portion of the ICA. You have to find your middle clinoid process. You have to find your dorsum cell, and you have to find everything you need according to the aim of surgery. So your alphabet, you see it perfectly here, this is this, the carotid sulcus. And you should know this. And you have to find this. And you have to move laterally the carotid. And if you look to this anatomy in the beginning, nothing is possible to be recognized. What does it mean, what I'm telling to you? It means that the anatomy is really the basis, but you should have the ability to go much, much more forward in the understanding that you are only knowing the alphabet, only knowing the letters. And it's a very nice picture on the left side of my screen showing with the blue and pink and red and yellow, nice of details, but in reality, anatomy is nothing by itself. So going into the real change in what I'm trying to tell into you and putting your anatomical knowledge into a real more uh, interesting way. So Puja has, has asked me, please talk about sphenoid. This is what I want to do. Transphenoidal, transtuberculum, cavernous sinus, transcribal, transpyrigoid, transcordial. I will not spend all your days and all your hours and Puja after uh, 20 minutes will stop me because it's uh, necessary to to say uh, the word hand uh, to my lessons but uh, the real topic that should be kept in your with you is to try to see anatomy in a different way so back to your alphabet have a look to this picture it's uh the pituitary and and the supracellular regions as seen from above this is the alphabet so you see the pituitary stalk, you see the superior hypophysial arteries, you see the intracranial portion of the ICA with the, with the anterior, anterior cerebral artery here. OA is for ophthalmic artery. Most of the time the ophthalmic artery is running from the intracranial part, there are, but there are exceptions from this rule. And you see the optic nerve one and the other that are linking one each other, joining one each other to form the chiasm. And so have a look to this marvelous picture I've taken from uh, work from Pittsburgh. It's not a picture of mine. Uh, the references is just below, but it's very important that you understand that uh, after you have removed the bone, there is a periosteal layer in the center of the pituitary. And just behind, there is another layer between these two layer there is blood. This is the real anatomy you should keep in mind. And have a look to this. This is the same concept. So this is a picture of mine showing nicely with the white circle, the medial optical carotid recess and the lateral optical carotid recess, the periosteal layer of the pituitary gland. And I will focus in this slide on this. But if you go into a more detailed dissection, you see once you have removed the the periosteal and meningeal layer, the pituitary capsule. And this open a great possibility for surgery, just to 
transpose the pituitary gland. So this is the anatomy that you should look for. Not the names of a very unfamiliar and strange details. This is the anatomy that should allows you to go to your patient and to do surgery and to do things that are important for your surgery. So left side, anatomical structure, car parot carotid artery, lateral optical carotid recess, pituitary gland. And here you see exactly the tuberculum cell here, the supracellar notch just over there in a very bony uh, patient that is different and is difficult. Here you have a, a very nice supracellar region. Here you have a very unfamiliar and very not nice um, supracellar region with the tuberculum cell. You are very bony tuberculum cell. And these are the same concept applying from your anatomy to a real surgical anatomy. So in this way, no matter you're using the drill or whatever, you should find your meningeal layer. So have a look to the anatomical picture that show you exactly what I'm telling in the surgical. So in the mid part, when you're dealing with your pituitary, once you have removed the bone, you see the periosteal layer and behind that there is the meningeal layer and behind that is the capsule of the, of the gland. And uh, what, what is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is that you can go inside and you see the diaphragma cell here and you see the supracellar system here once you have removed your tumor and you have no CSF leak and it's normal because anatomically speaking, the diaphragma cell is part of the meningeal layer of the, uh, the, the composed the cavernous sinus, uh, allows to the pituitary stalk to pass through. It's not just uh, in this way. And uh, the, if you look in reality, once you go from below, you see exactly this bluish structure that is the supracellar system coming down. And so you're looking this part, you see the, the, the arrow that is moving, you're looking this part that is running down once you have removed in a, I would say, normal pituitary surgery in which you have done your work. And in this way, you understand the real meaning of the diaphragma cell, the meaning why some, you cannot do in the dumb shell tumor from below, you should change your surgical approach because if the diaphragma cell has been enlarged, you can pass through this and coming from below to the top. But if the diaphragma cell is narrow, you cannot pass through this and you are going to deal with very risky situation. And this explains this concept. So this is the anatomy that I would like to show you. And so going to detail, have a look there. The, 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 yellow, the yellow asterisk and, and the, the arrow head, the blue arrow head are showing you uh, the upper and lower dura rings that anatomically speaking are the borders of the clinoid part of the ICA. And so have a look in this dissection, this is a bony dissection. This is a soft tissue periosteal layer dissection. You see the clinoid and the, this is the, uh, the cavernous and this is the clinoid portion. And you see what I showed you before from above. Have a look to the, the origin of the ophthalmic artery just over there is above the upper dura ring. That means that you run here, you found CSF. And if you run here, you found blood because you are inside of the, the cavernous sinus or the, the inter, superior intercavernous sinus. And here, here, you have the middle clinoid process that is not corresponding to the medial optical carotid recess. There are two different positions. And you say, oh, what is it, the interest in middle clinoid process? The interest in middle clinoid process and you should see in the CT scan is that, have a look to the dry school, 
in the in the bottom of the of the screen. This is the middle clonoid process that is fusing with the anterior clonoid process, forming a collar around ICA. And so when you are dealing from an anterior perspective, endoscopically assisted in this area, this is the region of the middle cranoid process. You should be aware that around ICA, there is no collar. This is the real anatomy I would like to show you. So going in to the understanding of this, as seen from above, it's a very nice picture taken in Vienna. You see exactly OA, ophthalmic artery, the optic nerve, the aframa cell, all the, 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 the prepontine cistern here with the Lidquist membrane and the PCOMs, so the, uh, the vascularization. Changing your perspective and understanding the position of the optic chiasm that can be uh, a little bit different, can be here, it's a story, can be here, can be there. And this make a very big difference in selecting the approach or making surgery much more complex. So thinking anatomy simply by the concept of uh, uh, telling a story is something that is really boring. me. It's something that uh, I started from there, but it is only the alphabet. And this is the story. So what Jacopo, is the... Jacopo, can, I, can, I, can I tell everyone or can you tell those... Um, anatomical specimen that you show are those injected. So some most, of are, most of them are injected, most of them are injected, yes. Okay, okay. So what about that structure I told you before, the middle cranial process? You see my, the, the, the arrow of my, of, on my screen? Here is the middle cranial process. It is, is a collar, this is a collar, and this is an in vivo situation. So the tuberculum cell is just over there and you are dissecting the pituitary and here you have your middle cranoid process and you have to go there simply by drilling or with the carison whatsoever. So this is the anatomical structure here. And you should be aware in the CT scan that you are not facing with a collar. That means a bony structure behind ICA. So that means very difficult story when you're dealing from that. And go and understand a little bit above. The tuberculum cell is here. So here, here, this is the tuberculum cell in the shape of the tuberculum cell, the fossa that is the pituitary fossa, the dorsum cell just over there. And here you have your planum spinoidale according to the shape of this and to the bony thickness of this part, the resection could be not so easy. So what is interesting is transposing the anatomical view into reality. And so in the video, you see exactly how many of you for sure have done in your activity, the removal of the tuberculum cell in a supracellular approach. It's not important which kind of approach uh, we are going to deal in this case. It's important that you have to do this phase of surgery in the same way, knowing and remaining outside of the periosteal layer. In this way, you avoid blood. It's easy because blood is behind the periosteal layer, in between the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. So what's happened if we go a little bit more inside? Well, of course, in anatomy, this is a typical opening for any kind of uh, supracellular approach, but you can see in the bottom of the screen on the left side, the arachnoid just in front of the uh, optic chiasm. This is very difficult to appreciate in cadaver because arachnoid doesn't exist after the death of the patient. So the picture taken here and the real anatomy as seen in surgery is by far more fitting with reality. 
So the pictures show in the last in in the, the bottom part of in the bottom part of, of the screen on the left side is showing nicely the arachnoid. And this is the arachnoid here in the center part, and you see the pituitary gland, you see the superior in intercabinous sinus here, and you see the optic chiasm given by the joining of the left side and the right side optic nerve. And above the optic chiasm, you see the complex of the anterior, the anterior cerebral artery with the anterior communicating artery. In this case, it was present also the recarter artery of Eoben. These are not so important now. What is important is understanding the three-dimensionality of these. So going into the details, once you remove the arachnoid, seeing the amazing vascularization given by the superior hypophysial artery. Have a look on the chiasmal branches. There are a lot of anatomical papers and description about that. Uh, what is important to stress is that this kind of small vessels, especially in case of a craniopharyngioma like this, should be really spared because they are important for the function of the uh, optic chiasm. So as you see in the anatomical uh, picture in the middle of the bottom part of the screen, you see all these very nice and thin red strings that correspond nicely to the uh, part that you see in, the, in, this, in this in vivo situation. So, and again, and again, going into to the knowledge of the pituitary stock and the meaning and the function of the pituitary stock. It's quite normal to find a round, just like a collar of arteries, given normally from the, from the, the branches of the superior hypophysial arteries that connect one each other just on the undersurface of the chiasm here and form a collar with this, this linear arteries. These are, there are very nicely description in the anatomical lab, but the application of this description is of sure important, but should be kept in mind that surgical appearance could be a little bit different from that. So have a look inside here. It was a meningioma in that case. Here is the superior hypophysial artery. As you've seen, uh, when I'm moving the, 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 the arrowhead on my screen, I think that you are looking at, and this is superior hypophysial artery. Remember that can be more than one, of course. And yet this is one of that. This is the pituitary, uh, pituitary uh, stock just over there here and just over there here. So in this case, what is nicely to, to understand is that uh, in, in the central part, once you, you have managed the two layer and you stay a little bit above, you enter in a, what is called a supracellular approach that can be done just inferior or superior to the, the chiasm. And of course, it depends on the pathology and the anatomy should be read according to these. And what is important is in this case is the understanding of the position of the ophthalmic artery here, here, with the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery, as I told you before, is most of the time, most of the time is, uh, is coming, is a branch, is the first branch of the intracranial part of the ICA. So which the name of this is the upper dura ring here as the clinoid portion between the upper and lower dura ring. Above, you are the intracranial part. Above, there is CSF, there is water there, and the optic nerve is in strict relationship with the, the ophthalmic artery. That means that when you are going to deal with uh, uh, optic nerve decompression, if you want to open the dura, you should know that the, here's the dura, here's the carotid, is the dura of the optic nerve. You can extend if you want, if you want, you can open, but where you open, you should know that uh, you can find the ophthalmic artery in the inferior part. And if you want to open the dura shield of the optic nerve, you should do this technical part in the upper half 
of the optic nerve. This is the anatomy that I think it's really critical for the patient. And so going back to that, once you have understood is to see the same vision here in the left side. Left side is the anatomy. There was no hibernate artery on this part. You see two, you see two communicating arteries here, one and two is the complex and you see here. So knowing this anatomy and applying from the lab to the uh, OR, it's really something that makes your effort to be uh, familiar with that really worthy to be done because it gives the reason. So my experience went in the lab, but I think that it's more than five years that I have no more dissection. Oh, I had very few only in the courses where I, I went, where I go. So, and now my surgical training, my surgical anatomy is becoming more and more interesting because what I learned in the lab is becoming more and more important in my application. So going to details, you can go, you can see the third vertical and this is not important. Just the last 10 minutes to focus and uh, Pooja uh, will stop me if necessary on the, I've done the mid part, I've done carot, I've done the pituitary, I've seen and show you the central part of the anatomy. I would like to tell something about the cavernous sinus because Pooja asked me uh, something uh, about this. Uh, the cavernous sinus, it's, uh, it's necessary to understand that it's a, a very bloody area. It's a very bloody area. And uh, a lot of sinuses, superior hypophysia, the superior petrosa, inferior petrosa, the basilar plexus, join one each other and the cavernous sinus. So it's a, I would say it's a skull-based sinus. It's a, uh, you don't believe me? Have a look. It, everything is in connection. It's, uh, it's something that it's uh, amazing. And uh, I would say for uh, other <laughs> point of view to refine, uh, have a look about uh, the blue aspect of the story. Uh, there is blue everywhere. Blue here, the inferior petrosal sinus, the basilar here, uh, the cavernous sinus. Uh, there is a circular sinus uh, around the stalk. Here is the region of the stalk. Here is the posterior clinoid process, the right side here. So everything is in connection. So, uh, of course, there is a one cavernous sinus and, and another one. Oh, my God, something happened. Oh, I don't know why. Anyway, uh, going to detail, I want to show you why it's important that you see in your mind 3D. So have a look in one perspective and try to see what happened when you move inside of the sinus. I, I will not go into too much detail, but keep in mind that the structure are not like in the drawings. In the real situation, things can be a little bit different from what you have seen in the drawing in a book. What I'm telling, uh, why I'm telling you this, because especially for, I would say, make an example, the fourth cranial nerve in the posterior part of the cavernous sinus, fourth cranial nerve is below the third cranial nerve. So the trochlear nerve is below the oculomotor nerve. But when you are coming anteriorly to the superior orbital fissure, this relationship change and the fourth cranial nerve become superior to the oculomotor nerve. And you say, oh, what happened? Nothing wrong. There is a, a clear explanation. The trochlear nerve is for the superior oblique muscle. That is the most superior muscle in the orbit. So the nerve, the motor nerve that come from the brainstem and enter the, the tentorium cerebellum and enter the cavernous sinus 
whenever you need to go to this superior oblique muscle should go up and the oculomotor nerve that is the nerve for the other muscle except the lateral rectus muscle of the orbit it's involved in the most inferior muscles that means in the cavernous sinus the relationship between the oculomotor nerve and the trochlear nerve change and what is above posteriorly is inferiorly in the anterior part this is not difficult it's simply related to the function of the structure so Puja said okay talk about anatomy of the cavernous sinus perfect this is the upper part of the cavernous sinus the anterior clinoid process just over there is the right side the white asterisk is the uh, oculomotor nerve entering with the, its own cistern in the roof of the cavernous sinus here and have a look of the uh, ligament that are that compose the oculomotor triangle this is the anterior clinoid process the uh, interclinoid fold here the petro petro uh, the posterior petroclinoid fold here and the anterior uh, petroclinoid fold that means there are connection between the petros portion here anterior clinoid portion and the anterior clinoid uh, process and the posterior clinoid process here and this is a triangle and this is the triangle posterior clinoid here anterior clinoid here and petros apex here so the uh, the ligament here the ligament here and the interclinoid fold here and whenever you remove the dura here and the clinoid process here you see what it, you can see from below you see the oculomotor part you see the clinoid part and you see the oculomotor part that form the two part of the roof of the the of the cavernous sinus i know that is difficult i know that this if you don't apply to surgery it's very very complex to be kept in mind this is the reason why i change the perspective and i try not to present you this kind of anatomy that is for sure the alphabet this is the uh, lateral view of the ica the clinoid has been removed the white circle is the optic extract here and you see the the ligament the the fold connecting the anterior clinoid with the, the petros apex here and you see what is the space of the anterior clinoid process when the nerve the the structure is removed and here you have sorry and here you have your collar what you have seen through the nose you can see from lateral point of view because anatomy is still the same and you should be able to see the structure that you have searched that you have searched for in the lab in your surgical experience and give the structure their meaning so this fold here is the interclinoid look at this this is the interclinoid fold and this interclinoid fold is a very good landmark for the oculomotor nerve if you come from an endoscopic and the nasal transcavernous sinus approach to reach the roof and to do this you have to know that the capsule of the of the the pituitary gland is still there and you should not enter into the the gland and you go between the carotid artery and the capsule and this has been called a transcavernous approach so back to reality just to make things much more easy back to reality this is the optic nerve just over there the carotid lateral optical carotid recess the cavernous sinus just over there here and remember the position of the cavernous sinus in respect to the orbit so a very nice anatomical view here the optic nerve the lateral optical carotid recess on the y the yellow arrow just over there the light blue arrows show the medial aspect of the superior orbital fissure and sof of course is for superior orbital fissure in the in vivo situation and below the superior orbital fissure you see the maxillary tract there is a bony landmark that is very very useful to find 
V2 to find the superior orbital fissure. V2 is below the maxillary strap. C, M, MP is for, for maxillary prominence. And according to how the sinus is pneumatized, most of the landmarks can be easily seen or very hardly seen. So my one of my first video showed that it's nice to face with a very well pneumatized sinus, but sometimes it's not so easy because anatomy is there, but you have to find. So understanding a little bit more the relationship between V2, the vidian nerve here, and the cavernous sinus allows you to understand how to go in the anterior part, lateral part, and into the cavernous sinus itself, if there is disease or not. And these are other aspects of the of discussion. But what is important here, you have here, it's clearly seen the meningeal, the, the periosteal layer covering the carotid here. And here, the a periosteal layer are being removed. The, the, um, this is the vidian nerve here. And you see exactly in that area, the, the third branch, the second branch here, and the, the vidian nerve is just over there. And in this way, you can gain space to see the nerve of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Remember that the nerves are included in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, except one. Only one nerve is not included in the lateral wall, and this nerve is the absence nerve. The six cranial nerves is inside of the cavernous sinus. And here, just in a few seconds, this concept uh, will be much more easy. And uh, the concept that in the lateral role of the cavernous sinus, the nerves are included is very important from a neurosurgical point of view in order to, to try, it's not easy, to try to do what is called the interdural dissection. So this is six cranial nerve that is inside. The six cranial nerve is normally in relationship in the lateral side with the first branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve. And anatomically speaking, just for an information, it's important because the sympathetic fiber coming from the carotid run and jump on the ablutions nerve and then go to V1 and then go into the orbital content. So you see the of time, the ablutions nerve here. <coughs> Sorry. This is the many the, the periosteal layer on the carotid here. V2 here, V1 is not so easily seen here. Here you are going to see the metal scale <laughs> in the top of the uh, of the um, Petrus apex. Um, it's okay for you. It's okay. perfect. <laughs> okay, this is what I told you. So see, this is the capsule. This is the capsule. This is the capsule. This is ICA. You can use this corridor between the capsule and the ICA to make a transcavernous approach, to make a amy transposition, because there are ligaments. The paper described by the group of Pittsburgh, the, especially by, by Fernandez Miranda, is amazing. And it's describing perfectly, as you see, seeing the, 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 the drawing, it's perfectly showing. You see the diaphragma cell, the anterior clanoid, and the ligament that are connecting the, 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 uh, the pituitary gland to the undersurface of the, uh, of the uh, anterior clanoid process just over there. And this structure is the interclanoid fold. So if you remember my picture before, this structure is a, an important landmark to see when you are dealing here to see with a landmark to find the oculomotor nerve. So everything is in connection. But if I try to, to give you all these details, one after the other, without showing the meaning of the significance of that, in this part, you see the pituitary region just over there, the carotid and the capsule totally maintained here, and ICA. And you have no pituitary tissue inside of that. 
I will skip because I don't want to bother you uh, too much. So removing the, the dress, the dura layer on the ICA, the cavernous sinus here, you can have totally access to the medial part of the cavernous sinus by entering this area. But to do this, you have to be able to remove the middle clonoid process if there to open that space. And in that area, there is no CSF because CSF is just above the tuberculum. So you are dealing with blood. You are dealing with eventually, most of the time are pituitary tumors and you are dealing with using an endoscope with that area. So have a look back again to the anatomical part and have a look to the steel, to the screen that I've done here that show you the roof of the cavernous sinus and the third and the fourth cranial nerve that are the oculomotor and trochlear nerve that you are looking at this. And as I told you before, these two nerves shift one each other. So nicely shown here. Here is the left side here is the cliver recess just here. You see the, the cavernous portion here. You see the clinoid part here. The optic nerve is just over there. The lateral optical carotid recess here. And you see the bending, the curve of the carotid inside of that, the clinoid, the posterior clinoid is just behind that. The anterior clinoid is there. And if you go inside and you use an endoscope, an, ang an angled endoscope, cover a sinus ear, there is no blood. Why there is no blood? Because you have not opened this part of the cavernous sinus. The patient was operated for a, a pituitary adenoma here, and this part of tumor has been removed, and we have not opened this part, and the tumor was not there. So probably small part of tumor is still there because if you remove everything, you have blood. But uh, as you see here, the paraclival with a 45, no residual tumor seems to be there, probably some part. But what is nicely seen here is the position of the oculomotor nerve here or the trochlear nerve. So we are looking inside of the bending of the cavern of the ICA that it's here to the third and the fourth cranial nerve on the lateral side. So more or less this, this way. And what is the risky area there? Is the possibility to find some arteries that are mainly the meningo hypophysial arteries, this less probably the infralateral trunk that is laterally located. But if you want to go to the into the cavernous sinus pass anteriorly, like in this case, you see the sixth cranial nerve just over there, just over there. And all these uh, small connections are sympathetic fibers. And you say, oh, what is the meaning of that? Well, simply the fact that if you damage these fibers, you have a Claude Bernard Horner. The patient has aptosis, a damiosis. So anatomy is the alphabet. But the surgical application make this really much more interesting and you are able to fix in your mind these details. So coming to back to the letters, third cranial nerve, fourth cranial nerve, right side, ILT is for uh, inferior lateral trunk. And as you can see, the oculomotor nerve and fourth cranial nerves are shifting the position one each other. Here, here, the sixth cranial nerve and the fourth is there, you see? Third, the sixth cranial nerve is not part of the lateral wall. So the oculomotor nerve, the fourth cranial nerve is there, the fourth cranial nerve is there. And as you can see, there is just like a triangle because the fourth cranial nerve coming anteriorly is becoming up and the third cranial nerve is going down. That means that the position, the relationship change and uh, what is the meaning of the ILT? The meaning of the ILT is that you, have, you can have an ophthalmoplegia of the patient and not for a direct damage of the nerve, but simply 
for an ischemia that you can create on the vessels. This is the real meaning to understand this concept, this anatomical concept. Uh, I will skip this. Uh, just one sec, one word uh, on the sixth cranial nerve. That is one of, I would say, one of the most delicate nerves in that area. Uh, this is a, a 45 view on the right side in the petrous apex on the uh, paraclival and that more or less the cavernous ICA. And it is the, the intradural part of the nerve. Uh, many people say that uh, this is the Dorello canal. I think that Professor Shabisher will scream about that. It's a dural opening here. And this is a, a venous gulf form if given by the cavernous sinus, the uh, inferior petrosal sinus, the basilar plexus, but it's typical this bending. And here is the Durello canal. Here is the Gruber ligament, and here the nerve enter into the cavernous sinus here. So the drawing is useful to make understand this. And what is it critical and important is that the relationship of this to the ICA, it's it's very very important here in the in the anterior part, as I show you before, but also in this posterior cavernous part. And the nerve, what is important to stress, is very delicate in that in this area. Uh, this is an in vivo situation. Uh, just two concepts about the vascularization of the cavernous sinus. MMHT is the meningohypophyseal artery. Traditionally is described as a, 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 a trunk, uh, meningohypophyseal trunk is a trunk with the three branches. Anatomy is not like you read in books. The three branches as the dorsal meningeal artery, the Bernas conica sinari, and the inferior hypophyseal artery. The variability of these is totally uh, important. It, uh, it's not serious to tell people, oh, the meningo hypophysial artery is given from the, uh, you can have a lot of variation. And the same is applying on the vascular adjacent on, on the lateral side. Most of the time, the meningo hypophysial artery branched come from the posterior bend of the cavernous portion here, but it's not a rule that can be given in this way. So keep in mind that the variation about that are really important, but in this medial corridor between the, caverno, between the carotid and the pituitary gland, the arteries that you can find are the branches of the meningohypophyseal trunk. These are the branches of the inferior lateral trunk that are important for the vascularization of the nerve on the lateral wall. Uh, I want to simplify the concept. If you damage the inferior lateral trunk, most of the time you create an ophthalmoplegia to the patient. So in this nice dry school model, you see the meningohypophyseal artery here. Here is an endoscopic view. Here is a, a case in which I uh, was able to find the uh, one of the uh, inferior hypophyseal artery here that probably was not starting from uh, meningohypophyseal artery, but simply as a branch of the cavernous carotid artery. So this nice uh, inferior hypophyseal artery, DMA is for dorsal meningeal artery, and BCA is for Bernasconica sinari artery. That is a tentorial artery. Is an artery that go to the tentorium posteriorly are a didactic description, but it's not so, um, so uncommon to find variation. Um, it's okay. It's a lateral view showing this concept. A uh, few words more, a few words more. I want to stress this. If you want to manage the cavernous sinus, you should be able to go a little bit inferior. Going inferior, it's necessary that you understand what is laterally and infeatrally located to the, the cavernous sinus. So you have to recognize the uh, maxillary tract, foramen rotundum, the uh, pradicopalatine fossa, the vidian nerve, there are all landmarks necessary to manage the inferior lateral part 
of the sphenoid sinus. And in this very nice, I like this picture, uh, in this very nice view, uh, this anatomical relationship between the orbit, the pterygoid system and the sphenoid sinus are clearly shown. So the role of the maxillary sinus in respect of the superior orbital fissure and the foramen rotundum and the median nerve is clearly outlined here. So why radiology? Because anatomy by itself, it's as I told you, I think boring. I think I have talked too much, but I'm quite close to the hand. By why radiology? Because you should be aware that whatever you see in your lab, you should see in your radiological view and then back in your field, in your surgical field. And that whenever you need to go in the inferior part of the cavernous sinus, most of the time you should be able to manage the pterygopalatine force. So I will not spend time on this because you have time to see and probably you know better than me this area, but for sure all these modules, all these spaces should be well understood if you want to deal with the pathology. So this is the anatomy that I love because it's anatomy that came from the OR and back to the lab. Of course, you need to learn your alphabet and understand that there are a lot of branches here. There is the, the, the DPA, the descending palatine artery, the, the greater palatine nerve just behind, the connecting branches between the pterygopalatine ganglion and the vidian nerve and the V2. And, but what is important, and nicely you can see also the sympathetic fiber around the, the maxillary artery. What is important? That you should understand the meaning. If you create a damage to the vidian nerve, you can have a dry high because the, the fiber brings information for the lacrimal gland. And this is important to be understood. So this is anatomy that it creates in your mind important concepts. So nicely, this is the cavernous sinus. Oh, if the disease is there, what can I do? What is that? It's the lingua of the sphenoid. Most of you know the lingua of the sphenoid. The lingua of the sphenoid is that this bony structure is something that make your ICA fixed. If you don't remove the lingua of the sphenoid here, this is a right side as seen from above, foramen root, foramen ovale, Foramen spinoso, Petro's apex here. This is the, 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 the line for GSPN and the, the, the position of the tube on the under surface. You are looking at this area. This is the lingua of the sphenoid. And if you don't move that, you cannot displace laterally your ICA. And uh, as a scene in dry school or doing this in the cadaver, it's much more easy. I spend 30 minutes, for sure there are surgeons that are uh, much more fast and faster than me, but it's not important that. Uh, it's a long way and you should be aware that this maneuver is necessary to remove and to gain enough mobility of the ICA. And so what is an anatomical landmark or an anatomical structure that could be Meaningless, if you want to do some surgery, is it necessary to understand and to do this? So the lingua of the sphenoid, this, look at the arrow in my screen, is there. And uh, with uh, a very patient, 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 surgical management, you can remove and have a look at how very, uh, acute and very uh, risky is this maneuver. Have a look here. So here you have your ICA, you have your cavernous sinus, you are here, done this, you can displace laterally your ICA and gain space procedurally or manage the cavernous sinus there. It's up to the pathology. I don't want to discuss about pathology in this case, but I want to show you how the surgical anatomy is seen in the dry school, seen in the endoscopic dissection, is applied 
in a in vivo situation. So, and this allows you to do what Pittsburgh group said. So we have to thank uh, these great guys to have teached us about the, this opening, these approaches. And uh, to do this, you can find your way to control ICA, the horizontal portion here, to see V3, this is V3 coming out from the foramen ovale here. And here you see all this structure in this drawing, all this structure, so V2, the median nerve, and giving enough space here allows you to find your way also in the petrous apex in a super petrous approach. And you see the relationship between V3 here, the median nerve, the horizontal portion here of the ICA, horizontal portion of the ICA, horizontal portion. The tube is uh, bluish here. The tube is here, the tensor belly palatini muscle, V3 coming out from the foramen ovale is a left side dissection here. And the same is applying here. So Petrus portion. And here you see in the Petrus apex, once the, that tumor has been removed, the possibility to visualize the second branch. So V2 here, V3 is going there and V1 is here. So the anatomy seen in the dissection can be transposed. So in this way, I think it's much more. And then look in the bottom, this is the uh, second branch. So the uh, maxillary nerve and you are removing all the bone around the uh, max, not, not all, but the medial part of the bone around the, the second branch of the maxillary sinus in order to gain space here. And this is the B2. So this is a different way to show anatomy, I think. Anyway, it's something that makes me a little bit more uh, interested. Uh, I think it's, uh, I could be, it, it could be enough uh, because uh, the topic was to talk about uh, uh, pituitary, a uh, little bit more about transplant and trans tuberculum and the cavernous sign with uh, its own, its, uh, uh, own uh, inferior uh, dissection. Uh, thank you for your attention, Puja, for the opportunity to show uh, this. And uh, anyway, I hope you have enjoy. Like I think that I think that one of the most brilliant uh, always. Uh, by by focusing on anatomy and also on uh, on live surgery and cases uh, and comparing one of them i have to give you the i have to tell you that i'm always fascinated i've been blessed many years ago it was uh, 2014 that i met uh, uh, Jacopo, we were uh, we were in uh, while I was in Varese with the guys, uh, and at that time I was spending time for uh, uh, courses and also dissection courses, and I was fascinated by the first initial assessments. Uh, I remember that at that time there was uh, the infra uh, the the um, orbital entrance to the to for approaching uh, pathologies on the mid-cranial fossa uh, and those uh, also um, interesting cases for uh, approaching through the endoscope inside of the of the mouth uh, to access to pathologies of uh, um, of the medial compartment. However, um, I was always fascinated by about your uh, experience uh, and the interaction that you have with Manfred Shabichev, with with uh, which I do know that you have. Uh, a, a huge admiration. I think that we don't have time for questions, but I think that you explain everything. So I, I know I'm watching the people around here. Everyone is satisfied. For those who don't know, uh, if you're going to, in our uh, YouTube page, there's a brilliant anatomical um, explanation of uh, transorbital approaches to the middle cranial fossa also by by Jacopo. I think that we can also address other step-by-step -step anatomical dissection um, courses with Jacopo. Jacopo have a brilliant, for those who don't don't already bought this book, please go. There's an amazing an book. book. It's an old book. <laughs> it's, it's, to you, it might be an old book, but it's explanation of everything. So it's, it's a mandatory step 
for anyone that will interact and get into that. So thank you once again, Jacopo, for your brilliant presentation. For anyone interested, you can you can uh, send uh, messages and contact Jacopo Dalang personally. He's a fantastic, he's a brilliant guy. It's very interactive. So don't don't miss out this. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and I will talk to you very very soon. See you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you to all.